somehow in God's sweet providence, he allowed a Sam Mountain boy from Alabama to serve as a trustee here at Southern Seminary. It's been my great honor. It's been my great honor, especially in getting to know Dr. and Mrs. Moeller. And I want to thank you both for your graciousness. From time to time, people will ask me, how would you describe Dr. Moeller? And I say he's the most gracious man I think I've ever met. And I appreciate you. 29 years ago, God called me to preach. I knew that that calling to preach carried with it a, an expectation of proper training. My father was a retired military man, but he had entered into the ministry, went to New Orleans Seminary. And when we talked about it, he told me, he said, John, the call to preach is a call to prepare. And I will take care of your seminary if you go to Southwestern or New Orleans. But I'm not paying for the other seminaries to make you a liberal. What a change. What a change. To God be the glory. I have two students from my church here, a third student in high school who's looking at ministry, and I'm already talking to them about Southern. Everyone that I talk to that I find wrestling with a call to ministry, I tell them, you need to go to Southern. What a change. Praise God. From whom all blessings flow. Amen. I want to ask you, if you would, to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 51. If you're able, I would invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. David said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion and your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. You can be seated. Psalm 51 is one of the most intimate and deep confessions that we find within the Word of God. As we read it, it's almost as if we are looking over the shoulder of David and watching him as he's literally engulfed with conviction and guilt. His hidden sin isn't hidden anymore. It's been found out. He didn't get away with it. And the reality of the sin is overwhelming to him. The background is referenced in the title of the psalm. It's David's sin with Bathsheba. Uriah was out in battle fighting for his king and David took his wife. He tried to cover his tracks. He, 
He sent for Uriah and tried to get Uriah to go and be with his wife, but Uriah was a noble man, and David rewarded his nobleness by having him killed. The word tells us that when Bathsheba's time of mourning was over, David brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the scripture says in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 27, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So God sent Nathan, and the prophet Nathan comes to David, and he lays out God's judgment upon him. He says in 2 Samuel 12 that David had Uriah killed with a sword, so the sword would not depart from David's house. David took Uriah's wife, so someone from David's own family would take his wife. Then David deserved to die. Understand this. David deserved to die. The law had no provision for death except death for adultery or murder. David deserved to die. But one of the most amazing utterances in the Bible we find in 2 Samuel 12, 13, where the prophet said, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. From that background, we come to Psalm 51. And in this psalm, you find two main concerns. The first concern is the removal of sin. You find it in verses 1 through 9. David is concerned with the removal of sin. If you'll notice in verses 1 and 2, you find David's plea. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. As you look at these verses, David has three sets of three. Three sets of things that are going on in this where he uses three words to describe what he's trying to to, to let us know. Look at it. First of all, he gives us three words of God's character. That's where David starts and that's where we should start. With the character and the attributes of God. David pleads for mercy. Have mercy on me, O God. He lays no claim to it. He doesn't pretend that he deserves it. He knows that God is just, but he desperately needs and wants the mercy of God. Secondly, he speaks of God's steadfast love. It's a covenant term. It's as if David is saying, God, I'm yours. I don't deserve anything but death, but I'm asking for your mercy. And I'm asking you for your mercy because I know that you are a God of love. God, give me your mercy. God, give me your love. The the English Standard Version repeats it. It says, according to your abundant mercy. But but, but I like the way the New American Standard Bible translates it. It says, according to the greatness of your compassion. David is asking for God's mercy, for God's love, and for God's compassion. Can you imagine an omnipotent God who did not possess those three qualities? David's pleading on the character of God. And he follows those three words with three words for his own action. And listen, he he doesn't hide what he's done. He doesn't try to clean it up. He doesn't try to justify it. David is confronted with the evilness of his action and he confesses it with three words, transgression. Transgression is active rebellion, iniquity, open perversion, sin, cosmic treason. He's seeking in a sin to overthrow his, God's rightful reign over him. He, he knows that he has sinned. And, and, and understand this, as I might say in Alabama, he doesn't try to put lipstick on a pig. <laughs> he doesn't try to, to clean it up. His sin is dirty. It's appalling. Steve Lawson said he doesn't call it weakness, he sees it as wickedness. He doesn't call it an accident, he sees it as an atrocity. He doesn't call it sickness, he sees it as sin. Pastors, future pastors, missionaries, future missionaries, professors, future missionaries in this age of tolerance, we must learn to see sin as God sees sin president of one of our Baptist colleges recently, last year, addressed his state convention. 
He said some incredible things about the call of a Christian college. But at the end of that statement, he said this. We, his university, we are far from perfect. Sin takes place on our campuses. But we do not organize it. And we do not celebrate it. Church, when it comes to sin, when it comes to sin, we dare not rename it. We dare not excuse it. We certainly dare not try to justify it. And God help us if we try to organize it or celebrate it. What does David do? David confesses it. He confesses it. He follows his three words for God's character and three words for God's actions with three words for forgiveness. Look at them. Blot out my transgressions. Blot out. Literally, wipe them away from your book. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. The word for washing is a word that is used of of washing a dirty garment. Think of what the prophet says. Even our righteousness is a filthy rag. We desperately need God to wash away the perversion which clings so closely to us. And he says, God, cleanse me. Cleanse me from my sin. Blot out. Wash me. Cleanse me. Oh, God, make me ready to worship you before your holiness. That's his plea. But in verses 3 through 6, you find his confession. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. In verse 3, David acknowledges, I have sinned. It haunts him. Look at what he says. For I know my transgressions. You notice a repeat of the words. I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. In 2 Samuel, he was concerned with covering his tracks. But now he's no longer trying to cover his tracks. He's, he's overwhelmed with the sin. He desperately wants to be in the right relationship with God. In the first part of verse 4, David acknowledges that sin is, as as Sproul said, cosmic treason. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Yes, 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 he wronged Uriah. Yes, he wronged Bathsheba. But ultimately, he sinned against God. And I wonder if we have forgotten that we serve a holy, holy, holy God. Have we forgotten that the God who is holy, holy, holy has said to us, be holy because I am holy? Have we forgotten that he is our creator and therefore has the right to tell us what to do and hold us accountable when we do not? Have we forgotten that our sin is treason against God? Pastors, pastors, listen to me. It is God who called us. It is God who has placed us in the pulpit we must hold that position dearly we must treasure the privilege and refuse to dishonor the name of Christ by thinking that we can get away with sin perish the thought that the men of God would think they can get away with sin in the second part of verse 4 David acknowledges that God is just in his actions so that you are justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. So many today question the judgments of God. They question why God might judge the sinful person. But when we stop and consider our sin, do we realize what we deserve? Do we realize that as creatures of dirt who have taken our fist and shaken them in the face of our creator, do we deserve that, do we understand that apart from the abundant grace of God, we would receive just judgment? God is just in judging us, but he's given us his grace in Christ. In verse 5, David acknowledges that he sins because he is a sinner. Please understand this. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We are not partly dead. We're not mostly dead. We are dead 
in our sin. We are separated from a holy God. Paul deals with this in Romans 5, and the Adamic nature is passed down to us from our fathers. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin is what we do naturally. It's what we do naturally because we were born into the first Adam, but when we are born again, the second Adam gives us a new nature and changes our heart changes our life. David follows his plea with his confession with his need in verses 6 through 9. In verse 6 we see the great gulf between our holy God and, and our sinful being. We also see the great need for the work of the Holy Spirit. Look at how God-centered this is. We see the great need for the work of the Holy Spirit within us to teach us his wisdom in our secret heart, to teach us his wisdom in our inward being because we cannot come up with it on our own. We desperately need the sovereign grace of God to move in our life. We see how God-centered David is in this. Look at verse 7. He digs into his greatest need. Purge me. Purge me. One commentator said literally, descend me. Purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was used for many things in the Old Testament. Most of them had to do with sprinkling things, blood on the altar, but, but also it had to do with sprinkling blood on the leper who had been cleansed. I wonder if David saw himself as a spiritual leper. Purge me, descend me with hyssop. Wash me. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Purge me, wash me. And then in verse 8, look at, look at this. Let me, let me hear joy. And gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. David is crushed over the recognition of his sin and he's pleading with God for sovereign grace. Let me hear God. Move in me. Do it in me. Purge me. Wash me. Let me. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquities. How can a holy God hide his face? from our sins, David tells us the only way is that he blots out our iniquity. Only by blotting out our iniquities, only by forgiving us. You know what he's asking God to do? A few years later, the prophet Isaiah will pen it like this. Come, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. David sees this as his greatest need. He, he, he's not necessarily seeking to escape the consequences of his sin, but desperately desiring to get out from the guilt and the punishment of that sin. As you come to verse 10, you come to the second great concern of the psalm. Verses 1 through 9 has to do with the removal of sin, but verses 10 and following have to do with re the renewal of the sinner. And in these verses, he's asking God to do four things that only God can do. Four things that only God can do. Look at it. Create. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. The word create, same word from Genesis. It's is, is interesting. He, he, he is saying, God, create out of nothing because I have nothing good within me. Create out of me, God. Create in me. Create in me out of nothing because, because I sin. I sin because I am a sinner. There is nothing good within me. I am dead in my sin. Therefore, God, I need you to create in me a clean heart. Second word is keep. Create and keep. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. David was king. Because Saul found that God had removed his presence from him. He removed his spirit from him. David desperately does not want to lose the presence of God. Now certainly on this side of the cross we understand that the spirit now indwells us and never departs from us. But I would ask you on this side of the cross shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? Paul said may it never be. We can send ourselves into losing God's anointing. We can send ourselves into a place of losing the sense of God's presence. I wonder, I wonder how many people have walked these very halls. How many people have sat in this very sanctuary? How many people have received degrees from this very seminary who went on to preach but yet began to play with sin, hidden sin they thought. They came out and they lost the ability to preach because they sinned. 
against the holy God. We must seek to walk in holiness. We must seek to walk in faithfulness. David says, create and keep. But thirdly, restore. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Notice it's God's salvation. It's not David's to get. It's not David's to do anything but receive. It's God's salvation and it's God's joy. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. And so he says, create, keep, restore. And then he says, deliver me in verse 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. David knew he was guilty. He knew he was guilty. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Four things that only God can do. Create, keep, restore, and deliver. It's interesting when you come to verses 13 through 15, David's now promising to do what God, promising to do, to do what God created him to do if God will do the things he's asked him to do. He says, if you'll do these things, God, then by your spirit I will teach. I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. It's interesting to me that David's still teaching us. The Holy Spirit led David to pen these words. The Spirit of God led the people to keep these words and we have them in our Bible today. And here we are all these years later and the Spirit is still using the words that he penned through David to teach us. He said, I will teach, but also I will sing. I will sing, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. I wonder if we think about the things that only God can do. Have we been created? Have we not been kept by God? Have we not been restored? Have, have we not been delivered by God? Oh, the things that, that we should rejoice in as we sing of God's righteousness to us. I'll teach, I'll sing, I'll declare. I'll declare, oh, oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Confession and restoration is not never ultimately a private matter. Those who have been restored must speak up and declare the righteousness of the one who has made them righteous. In verses 16 through 17, David shows us the requirements of God. And he tells us that God does not delight in ritual. God does not delight in doing things for the sake of doing it. He delights in broken spirits and broken and contrite hearts that know their sin and know God's mercy and humbly worship and declare God's praise. The final two words are somewhat controversial in the commentaries. There are many who think that they were added by a scribe after the destruction of the temple or the captivity of Babylon and I see no reason to doubt David's authorship. He knows that leaders are not right, who are not righteous impact their people. David knows that his actions were sown and they would reap a harvest. Character matters. Character matters. Character matters whether you're the president or the pastor. Character matters whether you're the senator or the Sunday school teacher. Character matters whether you're a governor or a greeter. Character matters. I go back in closing to a, a question. How can God put away David's sin? There's only one way that sin is put away. There's a mystery in the Old Testament that is unfolded in the New Testament. There's a mystery that is unfolded. David speaks of a mystery of God putting away his sin, but, but Paul begins to unfold that mystery in Colossians. It's interesting to notice the similarity of words. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling. And he says that is blotting out. Same thing David asked for, by blotting out the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. I'm convinced that no sin has ever been forgiven except through the cross of Jesus Christ. Those on David's side knew what God had revealed to them and called out to God and responded in faith. And, and God responded to them knowing that he would nail that sin to the cross. And, and what's interesting, when you look at this passage, there's a glimpse and a shout. 
There's a glimpse of the cross. There's a glimpse. Maybe, maybe I'm making too much of it. I always fear when, when I see something that none of the other commentators saw. And I am definitely fearful when I say it in front of a crowd like this. David said, purge me with hyssop. Hyssop is used in many ways. But every time I read the word hyssop, I think of John's gospel. I think of when Jesus hung on the cross and he said, I thirst. And John says they took a sponge full of sour wine and they put it on a hyssop branch and they lifted it to him. And when Jesus drank, he said, it is finished. Paid him full. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Maybe there's a glimpse here, purge me with hyssop, but I know definitely that there is a shout of the work of the cross in Psalm 51. You see, there on the cross, our sins were purged. There on the cross, our sins were washed. There on the cross, our sins were blotted out. There on the cross, our sins were cleansed once and for all from the guilt and the punishment of our sin. There is no other way except through the cross. We have to see that we're guilty of cosmic treason, but we must also see that our God is a God of great grace. He will save us. He will cleanse us. He will purge us and wash us and blot that sin out if we will call upon him. The entire psalm reminds me of the prodigal son. He comes to the father, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. What a statement. He comes to him as father, but then says, I'm not worthy to be your son. He calls him father, but he knows he's not worthy. Do we know that we're not worthy to say, Abba, Father? Do we know that we're not worthy? Do we know that we don't deserve it? But what does the father and the prodigal son do? He sends for the best robe and he sends for the ring and he sends for the shoes and he sends for the fatted calf. He starts a celebration because he says, for this, my son, this is to be saying, son, it's not about your worthiness. You're my son. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. What grace. It's all because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You may wonder, why preach Psalm 51 to a crowd full of preachers and future preachers, of professors and future professors? That's precisely why I'm preaching it. The background of Psalm 51 is in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel. But David remained at Jerusalem. I've been preaching for 25 years in the church. And one thing I've found is that the call to preach carries with it wonderful blessings, but it also provides dangerous opportunities. If we're not careful, we can place ourselves outside of accountability. If we're not careful, we can place ourselves like David being where we should not be and doing what we should not do. And we can find ourselves justifying our actions and find ourselves standing week after week in the pulpit, preaching against the very sins that we commit throughout the week. What is it that you fear the most? I'm 52 years old. I've been preaching in the local church for 25 years, a little longer than that when you include not being on staff. I look at my life and realize that I'm, I'm, I'm at least at the halfway point, maybe a little further past the halfway point. And I can tell you what I fear the most. I fear not finishing well. I fear that I might let myself believe the lie. That I might listen to the voice, did God really say? that I might become like the people who come in my office who so often say, doesn't God want me to be happy? That I might listen to the lie and follow the enemy and bring shame to the name. I desperately, 
I desperately want to, with my words and with my actions to lift high the name of Christ. And David shows us something. He shows us that even a man after God's own heart can fall. Even a man who can write psalms like we sing and read and pray and preach can fall. My brothers, my sisters, learn from David. Devote yourself to walking in his Holy Spirit that you may not gratify the desires of the flesh. Learn to yearn for him so that you delight in him more than any sin that Satan brings across your path. Amen? Amen. Let me ask you to bow your heads for a moment. Father, I thank you for Psalm 51. I thank you that you cause all things to work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purposes. And while what David did with Bathsheba was horrific, we learn from that and we see your great grace and we experience your great mercy and we're encouraged to know that while we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that if we, if we confess that sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I thank you for those who are in this room, but I know, I know that there are pastors and I know that there are men and there are women and future pastors and students and who are struggling with sin. There may be some who are just clicking on something on the internet. There may be some who are just dabbling, thinking they can get just a little of it and they'll be okay. They'll never be caught. But God, would you let the testimony of David ring true in our eyes? And would you help us to yearn for you more than the very breath we breathe so that when Satan tempts us, we will look toward you and walk in your spirit. Help us, Father, I pray in Jesus' name.